Hello and welcome to the second interview in the series Myth Busting the Energy Transition. At the moment, there is great upheaval in the oil and gas industry. A combination of low oil price, COVID-19 is putting significant pressures on the energy industry as a whole. But more and more, government policy, large financial institutions and large businesses are looking at ways and means to use the financial um, recovery to articulate and accelerate decarbonisation and energy transition. So today's interview, we're going to be speaking with Ian Broadbent and discussing more aspects about the myths and the realities behind energy transition. My name is John Butler. I've got 20 years oil and gas experience and for the last 18 months to two years, I've been listening and hearing more and more about energy transition. So for me, this interview is actually quite an interesting aspect to find out more. And I'm Andrew Tilley. I've been working with the Energy Institute for the last two to three years now, and uh, also been working on top sites, predominantly brownfield projects with, uh, with project management, engineering, and construction companies. Um, really excited to do this interview today. I think it's an extremely current topic and very interesting given the current global COVID epidemic. Um, so. First of all, Ian, would you like to give a, a brief introduction to yourself? Thanks, guys, and uh, thanks really for the opportunity to take part in this um, series of uh, interviews. Um, I'm Ian Broadbent. I've, uh, up until recently, I was the MBA director at Aberdeen Business School, Robert Gordon University, where I was responsible for managing the MBA programme and the MBA oil and gas management programme. Uh, earlier this year, I set up my own consultancy business specifically to, to tackle um, the issues of energy transition and to support organisations who are uh, engaged with issues of, uh, of the energy, industry, uh, energy transition. Um, I'm a member of the Energy Institute, have been for uh, a couple of years, so I went down the, uh, the MEI uh, route. Um, Prior to working at um, uh, Aberdeen Business School, I did some uh, consulting, the early stages, uh, supporting the uh, Kincardine offshore wind project. Um, also, um, I've done various pieces of uh, research into consenting for uh, offshore uh, wind projects. Uh, before that, I spent 18 years in um, academia, um, scientific R&D in biotech, and uh, pharmaceuticals. So I work for academia, work for small to medium enterprises, I work for big, large uh, corporations. So I've got experience across a wide different uh, types of uh, organisations from working through the huge companies down to myself, um, but also uh, across different uh, sectors. But, uh, but what I see uh, at the moment is the real big challenge facing the, the 21st century is um, is energy transition and uh, how we're going to adapt our, uh, our industry uh, to support this transition to a low carbon uh, economy. Without further ado, the, the first question is, is what actually is the energy transition? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really, uh, really interesting question um, because uh, depending on uh, whether you're, you're an organization or an individual, the energy transition means different things, different, uh, different people and different, uh, different perspectives. And um, I, I think really something that I've been trying to get across to people is it's not just an energy transition. There are multiple transitions uh, going on at, uh, at different, uh, different um, geographies in different industries. The overarching theme is a transition towards a lower carbon um, uh, economy. But within that, different um, geographies, different countries will have different pos starting positions and different uh, finishing positions as well. It's a, a shifting uh, picture. Um, the pace of the energy transition uh, is um, has accelerated over the last uh, couple of years. And John mentioned the conversation over the last... 18, uh, 18 months to, uh, to two years. But really different countries will move at different uh, paces as well. What we're looking at though is, um, for in my view of the energy transition, we, we want to keep it quite broad because there's a temptation to look at it through a narrow specific set 
of issues to a particular geography but in fact we're looking at uh, changes in not only the way that we supply energy and produce energy but the way that we distribute it the way that we pay for um, our energy and the, the way that um, society uh, consumes and uses energy all these things are, are changing and all of these things are part of the overall picture of, uh, of energy transitions that's an interesting point so i guess if you imagine that two years ago like you say like energy transition was uh, something that really wasn't talked about what guidance would you look uh, and uh, and support can you identify can be given to companies working in oil and gas looking to diversify out of their traditional work scopes and move more into energy transition itself? Well, I, I think um, th there's uh, th there's a lot there's a lot in there. Um, as you say, that the, the conversation has changed over the last. Uh, a couple of years and actually we're talking about myths and myth busting i think the biggest myth that has been busted in the last couple of years is that we don't need to do anything the status quo is uh, is, is acceptable and i, I think uh, actually the the conversation has moved on in the last uh, uh, couple of years and most uh, organizations the the actual um, uh, public opinion has, has, has shifted that this is a, a real um, uh, pressing problem, a grand challenge for the 21st century. You know, we've got, by the end of the century, there's probably gonna be yeah, something like 11 billion people on the planet. So we've got to make sure that those people are, are, are well fed, that their homes are cool in the summer and heated in the, um, heated in the, in, in the winter, um, and that they've all, uh, there's, there's a successful uh, economy to, to support uh, the prosperity of those, uh, those 11 billion uh, people. So I think the, the, the myth that we do nothing and we just carry on uh, burning fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that uh, myth by and large has been uh, busted. You will get some uh, occasional uh, people, the equivalent of flat earthers, that will, um, that will uh, push back and say, yeah, we can, we can carry on. But I think you'll see that even um, uh, across the, uh, the oil and gas industry now, there's a, a change in the uh, debate, there's a change and an acknowledgement that um, the, the way that uh, oil and gas has to be produced has got to be produced in a more uh, efficient manner to reduce um, uh, uh, emissions. And still acknowledging that for the foreseeable future, foreseeable decades, we are still going to need uh, an oil and gas industry. We are still going to need oil and gas and the products, uh, the downstream uh, products uh, from uh, from the uh, from the industry. So, in order to support the, the more efficient and more um, uh, the, the re reduce the, the carbon emissions of the oil and gas industry and to address all of these problems at the multiple points of the, um, uh, the energy transition, there will need to be some support for uh, those organisations in terms of diversifying into, uh, into new industries, new sectors, also making sure that their current uh, operations are, um, are, are, are uh, minimise their uh, emissions as, as much as possible. So there is some um, support out there. There are various organisations that, uh, that um, provide provide support. Um, you'd, uh, you'd look to, uh, for, for example, in the uh, Aberdeen area, we've got things like the uh, Oil and Gas Technology Centre, the Net Zero Solutions uh, Centre. There are um, organisations like the uh, Offshore Renewables uh, Catapult. Um, there are organisations um, like the Oil and Gas uh, Authority that are um, providing uh, guidance um, and uh, support to, to organisations. In the northeast of Scotland, we've got Opportunity Northeast, which is doing a lot of great stuff in helping to uh, plan for um, and diversify the future for, for northeast uh, Scotland. We have, uh, universities have got a, a, a role uh, to play. Um, the uh, RGU has got its own uh, energy transition uh, institute and to, to collate um, teaching and research around uh, energy transitions. Um, then you've got organisations like the, uh, the Energy uh, Institute uh, itself, great source of uh, information and um, real um, 
uh, I mean, I, I get a lot of my information from the, uh, the Energy Institute's great source of uh, uh, data. But uh, I think one thing that I would, I would say about the, the various support and the networks is that there's a, a lot going on. Maybe there could be a bit more in terms of uh, joined up thinking in the way that these organisations support different aspects of uh, the, uh, the energy uh, transition. That's a really interesting point, and the, the one I'd like to pick up on is really around uh, where conventional upstream oil and gas companies and operators, um, and you know what energy renewable energy sources are available, um, and how can they be deployed to assist in in reducing their CO two emissions. Um, yeah. I think London Energy are, are sort of leading the way at the moment in some of the statistics they are producing and currently producing four kilograms of CO2 per barrel produced mm -hmm. um, and their target of less than two uh, by 2023 through their Norwegian operations where you compare that to the industry average and it's, it's up at 18 kilograms mm -hmm. of CO2 uh, per barrel produced. I think that's a really interesting point and there was um, a report came out um, earlier this year towards the end of last year actually the uh, energy transition outlook from the oil and gas authority uh, some really great data about the sources of uh, emissions from the oil and gas uh, industry and the bulk of those emissions come from the um, the, the power generation to support the uh, the offshore assets so burning um, uh, fossil fuels in these open gas uh, open cycle gas turbines. Um, that's the, the primary source of emissions. There are all other sources in terms of uh, flaring and um, fugitive uh, emissions. So um, I think the, the, the industry recognises that there are um, areas of their um, operations where emissions can be reduced. The challenge that you've got is that in the in the North Sea, a lot of these uh, assets are um, aging assets towards the end of the uh, the life cycle. You've got a lot of late life cycle uh, operators coming in and uh, uh, operating these assets. Is there the appetite? Or is, does it make financial sense to make those uh, investments into those uh, platforms and reduce those emissions when they're not going to be um, uh, they're coming to the end of, of their life cycle and this is the the sort of balance the operators have got to um, uh, got to find I think at the moment the the technologies um, so uh, for the likes of uh, floating uh, offshore wind to to um, to support offshore assets you've got things like the tampon uh, project with uh, floating um, uh, offshore wind uh, turbines to support a cluster of assets and power those uh, those assets. I think um, with increased deployment, the costs should uh, come down of these uh, of these technologies. But uh, let's not make uh, any bones about it. These are still expensive uh, technologies. And there has to be an economic case to make those um, uh, uh, make those investments alongside the um, environmental uh, case. So there's no easy answers there, but with increased deployment of these technologies, it should make it more uh, cost uh, cost effective. But it's kind of um, horses for courses with um, uh, um, with, uh, with renewables and uh, combining renewables with uh, oil production. So if you're a, an operator in uh, say the, um, uh, the Middle East, then it might make sense to, to have some uh, solar power to support your, your, your operations. As we're offshore in the North Sea, well, what have we got? We've got offshore wind, we've got some pretty hefty waves out there. So there might be some uh, um, ability to um, uh, uh, combine those uh, technologies. The other exciting uh, technologies, um, hydrogen, and uh, I think we may be going to get on to, uh, to some of that uh, as well as we uh, carry through the discussion. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thanks. And I, I guess um, because we're talking about myth busting here, one of the interesting things I'd like to drill that into a bit is um, some of the buzzwords. So uh, when talking about energy transition in oil and gas, we often talk about platform electrification. Mm -hmm. So from a layman's perspective, what ability does platform electrification 
uh, help to, to provide increased decarbonisation and reduced emissions? So, as we, um, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, about, about the energy transition outlook, uh, about seventy-five percent of the uh, emissions for the oil and gas upstream operations are coming from um, burning uh, gas in these open cycle uh, gas turbines to um, to to, put, to power those uh, those offshore assets. So it's a pretty big uh, prize if you can. Um, replace either partly or, or, or fully that that um, uh, that requirement to burn fossil fuels if you can replace that with some sort of um, uh, renewable uh, renewable energy um, whether whether or not that's offshore wind or whether it's some sort of um, uh, hydrogen uh, scheme or um, uh, or whatever um, but I think I'd come back to the point that uh, let's let's be realistic about uh, what can be can be achieved? Okay, there are uh, targets for for net zero, um, and uh, the uh, the target for for 2050 to reduce the uh, the operations uh, to net zero. But that will only be achieved if we can deploy these uh, projects and deploy them at scale, and deploy them sensibly to um, uh, to support clusters of uh, of, of assets. Yeah, really interesting. And one of the points you mentioned earlier was around hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and again, on the sort of theme of buzzwords, I mean, a, a lot is said about CCUS and hydrogen. Um, so I guess for me, why uh, why is CCUS and hydrogen talked about at the same time? Uh, you know, how, how are they interlinked? So it comes back to that, uh, that question of deployment um, and uh, deployment of technology. And uh, I think of CCUS and uh, hydrogen as complementary technologies that the, the accelerated deployment of one will help to accelerate the deployment of, uh, of another. And the, the reason being is that there's a lot of sort of um, shared technology, shared infrastructure and uh, skills and competencies that uh, are needed uh, across, uh, across the two. Essentially, it's a, it's a question of um, chemistry. Uh, so, um, the uh, hydrogen, there, there are no natural sources of pure hydrogen, so you have to really um, uh, source it from either uh, splitting uh, water or natural gas, and most of it is um, uh, made through, through the steam reformation of methane, so natural gas. So, where you've got um, large amounts of natural gas um, coming, coming ashore, as we do in uh, northeast of Scotland, then you've got an opportunity to deploy hydrogen technology. You have the, the steam reformation of uh, methane to get your, get your hydrogen. At the same time, steam reformation of methane generates carbon dioxide, which is not good. We don't want to be releasing that in, into the uh, environment. So if you've got the infrastructure and the uh, reservoir assets to uh, store, high, um, store carbon dioxide uh, under the ground, as we do again in the, the northeast of Scotland, we've got that infrastructure, then you've got this uh, complementarity between the two uh, technologies. We're producing the hydrogen, but we've got the byproduct, the carbon dioxide. What are we going to do with it? Well, we can use the carbon uh, capture and uh, storage technology uh, to deal with that. And then you've got your, um, uh, your hydrogen. Now, Hydrogen at the moment, the, uh, some of the issues are around how we uh, trade, uh, pay for, how we distribute um, uh, hydrogen, how we get um, um, uh, hydrogen to the, uh, to the consumer at a uh, uh, point of use. Um, but uh, I would say that um, we're in a, a good position, a really fortunate position in Scotland and particularly the northeast of Scotland to uh, have a real potential to be um, leaders in this new technology because we've got the infrastructure, we've got the, the skills and the knowledge in, in dealing with uh, 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 large quantities of, uh, of, of, uh, of gas. So, you know, there's, um, there is a real prize, a real opportunity there, and uh, there's a, a lot of excitement and uh, activity around those uh, technologies. It's good to get that, that uh, linkage between the CCUS and hydrogen, so, so thanks for that. I guess a lot of what we've been discussing up to this point is uh, kind of a, a North Sea and UKCS focus 
um, uh, viewpoint on energy transition. So when we look internationally and, uh, and look at other regions, what are the challenges and opportunities in other parts of the globe when they look at energy transition? Mm -hmm. And are they different from, uh, from those in the UK? Yeah, I, I, mean, um, I was um, lucky enough to, to discuss this with a, a couple of uh, former students in, uh, in Dubai um, quite recently. And uh, we were talking about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the challenges of energy transition in different uh, parts of, uh, of, of the world. I think, um, you know, the, the debate here is accelerated because of um, public pressure, because of um, the, um, the, the likes of Greta Thunberg and uh, Extinction uh, Rebellion uh, that we've all seen in the last um, uh, couple of years. And I, I think in the in the Middle East, it's a it's a different picture because they're at a different point in their um, uh, in the in the life cycle of their oil and gas industry. They've still got uh, lots of oil and gas uh, reserves. The North Sea is in a, a, a different um, different place. But I think there is a, a, an increasing um, appetite for um, uh, to explore these uh, technologies and an acknowledgement that sooner or later the uh, um, uh, the oil and gas is uh, is going to run out. But um, it's uh, I, th I think it's a it's a more um, it's a it's a more difficult conversation to have in certain um, uh, geographies. In the northeast of Scotland, if we'd have um, uh, surveyed um, a group of um, uh, oil and gas students maybe uh, three years ago uh, about uh, their attitudes towards uh, energy uh, transition and uh, uh, renewable energies and that sort, that sort of thing, I couldn't have even asked the, the question to, to the bulk of uh, my students because they'd have said, well, you know, we, we, we've just got uh, uh, the oil price is high. We're just going to, uh, you know, we, it's uh, business as usual. The conversation definitely changed in the last uh, in the last couple of uh, uh, couple of years. Attitudes have changed. People realise that actually the, the, the license to operate for these companies is um, is under threat if they're not seen to be doing something concrete in order to reduce their um, reduce the, the impact of their operations. So as young young professionals, which I imagine a lot of people watching this video will be, um, as we as we embark into the energy transition, where do you think the real career opportunities or job opportunities lie for for the young professionals and and wider? It comes back to the, the earlier point about uh, the energy transition being quite a broad um, concept. So if you're talking about the energy transition as reshaping the way that we produce and sell and distribute and consume energy, all of these uh, changes at, at the pace of change that, that we're seeing, all of these changes are going to require some bright minds to, to sort it out. And it's likely to be the not my generation or John's generation that are going to sort these uh, sort these issues uh, out. Um, you know, we, we've left left things in the, in a bit of a bit of a mess, to be honest. So it's going to need young people with the ability to see across uh, functional boundaries, um, with the ability to see things through other lenses. So engineers that can see through the, the eyes of a biologist and uh, and and vice vice versa. I think the uh, opportunities globally uh, are, um, uh, are vast. I know that uh, at the moment we're going through a contraction phase in the uh, oil and gas uh, industry in the um, uh, northeast of uh, Scotland. But I've always said that if people are, um, uh, are mobile in particular and passionate about helping society make this, uh, this change, there will be lots of uh, roles. Uh, that, uh, that frankly, we, we don't even know what those roles are yet. Uh, there was a, a, a great piece of work uh, last year by Opito and um, RGU that looked at the skill sets required to, uh, for the oil and gas industry for the next uh, uh, couple of decades. And the pace of change is so great that we don't actually know what some of those jobs are look like, gonna look like. I mean, if you think about maybe 15 years ago, Nobody knew what a, a YouTuber was, but now the, those uh, uh, it's um, it's one of the, the things that um, my kids aspire to, to be.
but uh, the, there are lots of different uh, ro potential um, roles if you're mobile, if you're uh, uh, passionate, and if you've got that mindset for solving problems, because there are plenty of problems to be solved. How do you think the oil and gas industry is perceived uh, by those external to the industry itself? I, I think there's, uh, there's, there's no question that um, it's gone through a really tough time in the last um, uh, couple of years. There are a lot of companies getting uh, some, uh, under, some uh, severe uh, pressure. I think it's been interesting to see the, the responses of the oil and gas industry. Um, I mean, the, there's been some really interesting uh, statements of strategic direction from the likes of uh, Bernard Looney at, um, at BP. And really, the the only thing the the oil and gas industry can do is try and get on that uh, front foot and demonstrate um, uh, some concrete results of what it's actually trying to do to to mitigate the uh, the impacts of its operations, and get back to the positives that the oil and gas uh, industry provides for for society. I, at the end of the day, we are going to need um, a, a, an oil and gas industry to produce the, the sort of uh, not only the uh, the energy to, to heat our homes and to uh, fuel our cars for the next uh, couple of decades we're going to need the the byproducts of the um, uh, petroleum industry in terms of um, feedstocks for um, uh, plastics and products if we're going to um, uh, continue to supply society with these uh, the products that uh, that it demands so uh, it comes back to that um, issue of uh, you know we're going to have 11 billion people on the planet how are we going to meet their energy de um, uh, demands in the uh, in the 21st century as you're saying there is going to be a requirement for the energy industry sorry the oil industry um probably after my generation if not two so with the current Sort of perception and the sort of the attraction of the energy transitions and the industries that will come with that. How do you think we can uh, continue to attract the talent into the oil and gas industry in the future? Yeah, I, I think it comes back to um, getting the message out about the positive uh, societal contributions. We are going to need this uh, successful oil and gas uh, industry for the foreseeable future to produce the, uh, the feedstocks for the, the products that uh, we want, as well as the um, um, you know, heating our homes and fueling our cars, because that's not going to be something that, that can be switched off. Uh, overnight, the key word is transition. It's going to be a, a, um, a change uh, over over time. I think the, um, the the job of the oil and gas industry is to portray as a, an opportunity to solve um, difficult challenges, to solve these uh, grand challenges for the benefit of uh, uh, society uh, in, the, in the long run. And um, as I say, there there are lots of different points. In the energy transition at which people that like problem solving are able to, to work across functional uh, boundaries for people like that to make um, a really positive uh, contribution uh, but uh, as we've talked about earlier it uh, it's it's not easy i don't underestimate uh, uh, that challenge so it's about the uh, the, or the the industry communicating it's uh, the, getting that positive uh, narrative across you know, here we are now, it's like towards the end of the interview, and really, I guess it's an opportunity for you know, students, young professionals who are listening to this interview. Um, based on your experience and your background, what advice would you give uh, these students and young professionals starting out their career in energy? Well, firstly, I think they've come to the right place if they're um, uh, associates or um, in the uh, Energy Institute and the, the Young Professionals uh, Network. It's a great source of um, uh, information, great source of networking as well uh, to, to meet with like-minded in individuals who are passionate about solving this grand challenge of the, the, the 21st uh, century. Um, I'd say that uh, allied to that point about networking, you're going to increasingly get your next job from your network. So having conversations with people, picking up the phone, um, getting uh, getting into uh, interesting uh, conversations again with like-minded people you're increasingly going to uh, um, find that uh, having that broader network is going to be really really uh, important 
I'd say the other advice uh, I'd be um, keen to get across is really around attitude uh, as well. Um, I'd, uh, I'd advise people to be um, impatient for, for change. So don't, um, uh, don't settle for, for things being uh, as, as the status quo, but balance that with a, a pragmatism uh, as well. You know, it's, it's about having adult conversations about uh, what's, what's possible um, and uh, what, what can be done um, to, to make a, a positive, uh, positive difference. So, um, yeah, um, I think um, getting yourself uh, educated is really important. So any opportunities you've got for personal development, um, so courses, um, or even if it's just you know, one-off webinars through to whole um, uh, degree programs at uh, uh, undergraduate or postgraduate uh, level. There's lots of stuff um, available, but don't stop learning. Always take that opportunity to um, uh, engage with uh, opportunities for, for learning. Ian, I have to say thank you very much for, for your insight. It's uh, really, really interesting to have someone with a commercial and academic um, background giving us their insights into the into what is such a huge topic and extremely current. Um, so of course you've got your own consultant, Broad Horizons consultant, and thank you very much for donating your time. Uh, also thank you to, to John for uh, assisting with the, the questioning uh, and then all the preparation and also thank you to all the, the viewers of this uh, for continuing to watch and support the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network. Um, I would also like to mention CNOC as our principal sponsor. Um, thank you very much for your continued support, especially during this, these difficult times. Um, and I know that this interview is part of a series. Um, I understand that we have Louise Kingham, uh, Chief Executive of the Energy Institute, also in the series, uh, which should be very interesting to hear her views. So Ian, John, thank you both once again. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys, for the opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.